Good morning, Cross Point Church. How's everybody? It's good to see you. My name is Jesse. We are glad you're here this morning. If you're in the lobby and you can hear me, come on in. Time to worship. Find a seat. You guys stand with me if you would. You guys ready to sing and worship today? All right. Thank you for being here. Sorrow tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken And my fear doesn't stand a chance has a place to hide and I'm not a captive to a lie and I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken no I Tell me this isn't a beautiful sight. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
Wow. Get some light and sleep. Y'all come up just a little bit or something. There, but there we go. I want the light right in their eyes. I want to wake them up, right? We are so excited. This is one of my favorite whew, Sundays of the year when we get to dedicate these children to the Lord. And as a church, we have a responsibility in that. We have our part in helping raise these children. So I want to introduce them to you first. And then I want to share with you about our responsibility. And then parents, I want to share with you about your responsibility. And then we want to pray and dedicate them to the Lord. So starting on my left, we have Braxton and Rowan Benfield. Parents, Daniel and Kendall Benfield. Next, we have Colt Bivens. Jamie and Christine Bivens. Next, we have Easton Brown, Ben and Dakota Brown, Charlotte Chrisman, Allison Curley. Then I'm in the way, so I'll move over here. Olivia Godfrey, Shannon and Talia Godfrey, Millie Hefner, Jordan and Hannah Hefner, Lucas Lackey, Jason and Jessica Lackey, Emmy Kate Moose, and Darren and Megan Moose. And then Kason White and Adam and Miranda White. Let me get out of the way. I want you to see these beautiful families. Can you give them a round of applause, please, this morning? We are called in... Deuteronomy, to have a wholehearted commitment, the Bible says. In chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, it says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you are going to bed. And when you are getting up, so pretty much be obeying the Lord and talking about the Lord at all times. We have a responsibility in this great excitement. When any, there, anytime there's a child born, there's great excitement. And there now are all these gender reveals where they're blowing up stuff and the smoke is pink or it's blue, right? We have all these parties and all these things and all this celebration of life of these children that are born. But the most exciting time is when your child is born again. Amen. And that is the most exciting time. It's the exciting time when they're born. But when they're born again, there is nothing to compare with that. It is responsibility of the parents with the support of this church to help them be at a place in their lives that they can discover Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is why we are here. Parents, it is your responsibility to provide spiritually for your children and to meet their needs, not only physically but spiritually, because if we just bring them and drop them at church, then you aren't doing your part. You need to be involved and you need to be serving and you need to be teaching them the same. I will now ask you some questions. And if you agree, please respond by saying we do. Parents, do you recognize these children as gifts from God who belong to God and that He desires that you raise them in His love? Do you promise to raise them with love, patience, discipline, and instruction, modeling Christian adulthood for them daily in all that you say and all that you do? We do. Will you pray for them and with them, teaching them the ways of the Lord, warning them about the folly of this sinful world and the snares the enemy has laid? Church, I will now ask you some questions, and if you agree, please respond by saying we do. Do you recognize that these children are gifts from God who belong to God and that He desires that you support this family 
And they will be raised in a church that is about serving our Savior Jesus Christ. Do you agree to give of your time and your talents and your finances where needed to ensure that these children and many others will be enabled to discover Christ by hearing your teaching and watching your life? Do you agree to pray for them and with them, teaching them the ways of our Lord, warning them of the folly of this sinful world and the snares the enemy has laid for them? Would you pray with me? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we dedicate these children to you. Lord, we thank you and recognize they are gifts from you. And Lord, we recognize that one day as they grow up and Lord, as they move away, which seems like such a long time away, it comes rather quickly. Lord, we will truly understand at that point that they were ours for a while, but they are yours forever. Lord, may these families understand the task at hand and making certain they see, hear, and know what a godly life looks like. Lord, as a church, may we never fall short. May we never stop doing all that we can in our children's areas, in our youth areas, to make sure we have a place that they can come and learn and grow and ultimately know that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and that they might receive you as their Savior. Lord, bless each of these dear children and their families. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We have a gift for each family, and it consists of a book on parenting that is very, very good that you need to really read and absorb to know some things you can do to help your child have a godly environment at home. There's also a children's Bible that they can use and look at and read one day. And there's also a rose for you, Mom, and Happy Mother's Day. And then there's also a letter that I have written to each of them for you to open on the day of their salvation and, uh, and read that with them, and that's going to be a glorious day. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, let's give these families another round of applause. We're so thankful to have them here this morning. And you can just pick up your gift on the way by there, and that way you won't have to be holding all that stuff like we've done in the past. Right? So here's the thing. If that doesn't get you ready to worship... I don't know what does. Amen? Amen. God is good. Let's all stand together.
Uh, you guys can just remain standing. We're going to prepare to give our tithes and bring our offering here in just a second. And as we're, we're preparing to give back part of what God has blessed us with, um, that's what this is about. It's an act of worship every time we do this. I was thinking, especially for the day of Mother's Day, maybe greatest blessing in my whole life is my mom, who I got to have dinner with. She came over to the house last night. That was awesome. And my sweet wife and the way she takes care of our kids and our house and me, you know, <laughs> I need help, you know. Yeah, God bless them. Just such a amazing blessings that mom are. But here's what else I was thinking about. Is that as much celebration needs to happen for, for moms today and these sweet babies that are up here, that's so incredible that for a lot of folks, Mother's Day is kind of a hard day. Some of you are mom today. I bet. Sometimes for, for Mother's Day, it brings back a lot of emotions and things that are sort of hard to think about. As we're thanking God for mom, I want to read this scripture over you just to encourage you if you're struggling a little bit today. Here's what it says that God will do for you. It says, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You guys bow your heads with me if you would. Let's thank God for moms. Let's ask God like a mother would to comfort people in this room today that need to be comforted. God, we are grateful for all the blessings you pour out on us, the material ones and the spiritual ones. Today especially, we set aside to thank God for moms. I thank you for my mom her godly influence in my life and I thank you for my wife and I thank you for my kids but for a lot of folks in here they need to be comforted today and I just pray through the Holy Spirit you would comfort them that they could find peace and encouragement today through the Spirit and that there would be joy for them God thank you for what you give to us as we give back part of it to you use the offering to do your will advance the kingdom for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful Running after me, your goodness is. 
is running after, it's running after me with my life. Thank you, God, that you are so faithful. We are so thankful for who you are. Let's do that one more time. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been faithful. Amen. You guys can be seated. We are moms who are pouring ourselves into our children every hour of every day. We are grandmothers who are also playing the role of primary caretaker. We are moms who are waiting to have children and trying our best to see the struggle through the eyes of God. We are moms who are learning the challenges of a blended family. We are moms in the workplace who are trying our best to balance competing expectations and demands. We are moms with adult children who are leaving our homes to pursue their own dreams. For packing lunches late at night, for cleaning out their backpacks, then filling them again, for offering gentle guidance to your own grown children, for becoming taxi drivers and appointment schedulers, for making sure the right baby doll is in their arms before they go to sleep, for helping them pay back their student loans, for cleaning and sterilizing and cooking, for doing their laundry and his laundry and our laundry, for praying and loving and forgiving and falling down and rising to your feet again. For the mom who is overworked and exhausted, for the mom who seems to spend a million hours on a million little things. For the mom who pours Jesus into her family as best she can. And God himself not only celebrates what you do, but rejoices over the uniqueness of who you are. You are seen and you are loved without limits. Welcome to Mother's Day. Welcome and good morning. 
It's been a blessing already. Amen. What a wonderful time in worship and celebrating families. And just want to let you know that today is a special day. And sometimes it's a wonderful, blessed day. And sometimes it's a tough day. Sometimes it's hard for us. Some things we have to deal with in loss or disease or something that is not in what we had hoped or planned. But know this, God is sovereign in it all. God is still God, no matter how we come to this day. But I wanted to share some things that maybe we would want to do uh, for moms today. Maybe you would want to celebrate her. Maybe you just want to praise her. Tell her she did do some good things after all. Maybe you want to visit her. Maybe you'd want to eat with her. That's one of my favorites. Anybody like to eat? Raise your hand. Yeah. And sometimes we get in trouble as husbands, not me, of course, but others who have said, you know, that is really good, but that's not how my mama made it. That doesn't work out good, guys. Just, just a hint there in case you were going to use that. Maybe you'd want to eat with her. Maybe you'd want to give her a gift. Maybe you'd want to talk to her. Maybe you just want to have a conversation with her. Maybe even if she doesn't understand, maybe even if she can't comprehend, maybe you would just want to remember her. Maybe you're not able to do these other things. And maybe just remember her. And I want to just say, if you're having to remember her this morning, either through loss of life or through disease and dementia, then remember those good things. Remember those fun things. Remember those times that you got in trouble and thought you got by with it, but then she busted you. Yeah. And then maybe sometimes on Mother's Day, we just need to forgive her. Maybe we just need to forgive her and go, Mom, I know that you had a lot on you. Maybe these things happened that shouldn't have happened. Maybe you made choices you shouldn't have made. But because I am forgiven, I forgive you. Maybe we just need to forgive Mom today. Understand, being a mother isn't easy. Being a parent isn't easy, but being a mother is even harder. Amen. That's right. Being a mother is even harder because even us guys, us tough guys, that if we're a dad, then we we still have the option sometimes to say, eh, go ask your mother. We have, God's given us that wisdom to say, go ask your mother because we know that sometimes those are mom answers. But being a mother isn't easy. And I don't know that I've shared this. If I have, I'm going to share it again. So one of my most fond memory, not, it's not a fond memory, but one of my most vivid, that's it, my most vivid memories of my mom, I don't think I'll ever forget, is her standing at the door, answering the door in her nightgown with no makeup on. Moms, imagine this. No makeup on, hair in rollers, <laughs> because of a situation I had on my first day of school. There was a boy that lived across the road who will remain nameless, and he was the only student sitting in a seat by himself on the bus. And growing up with an older brother, I got picked on a lot, beat up a lot, so it wasn't a big deal to me. So I asked him if I could sit down, and he said no. And looked at me like, what? Nobody's sitting down with me, pal. I run this thing. And he had hair about right here, so I thought it would be a great idea as a five-year-old to just knock his hair to the side. And I did. I said, well, thanks a lot. And he hit me with a right cross right here, and immediately blood is pouring all down my front of my brand new school clothes. They didn't have cell phones then, 
So my bus driver stopped and called the school, and the principal came and picked me up from Time Saver Market and took me and knocked on my door. And my mom came to the door, and I'll never forget her look of horror on my new school clothes as I'm pouring the blood. And I said, hey, Mom, <laughs> what a welcome. What a great job raising your child, right? So 13 stitches later, she was able to teach me life lessons about leaving well enough alone and keeping your hands to yourself. <laughs> so I pretty much had already learned that by the time the principal picked me up at Time Saver Market. But being a mother has those kinds of things. Some mothers have more of those, like mine. Some mothers had it easy because they had great kids like you who did what you were supposed to do most of the time. But there are many life-changing decisions that have to be made. There are many decisions moms have to make, sometimes on the fly, sometimes with a plan, sometimes not, but that are life-impacting and life changing and we're going to look at some of those decisions one of those decisions this morning in the book of exodus in a familiar passage of scripture a familiar picture in the movies if you will about moses birth and his mom exodus chapter 1 verses 15 through 22 and chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 And the Bible says this, beginning in verse 15, Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. See, we thought that this situation and all the political issues going on around birth and when conception occurs and birth and what's not birth and what's okay and what's not okay, there was something about infanticide right here. But it says, but because, in verse 17, but because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too because they knew that was right and they feared God. Pay attention as we continue to read. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women were not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives. They feared God. God was good to them. They did what was right. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply. See, that became a problem because the Israelites were multiplying more so than the Egyptians, and Pharaoh was worried that they were going to one day be so many that they would stand with another country's army and take them over. And so he said, kill all the male babies. But God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but let the girls live. Chapter 2, about this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when he could no longer, she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. 
Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother, her mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took the baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses. For she explained, I lifted him out of the water. What a difference it would have made had the princess said, I see this baby, I'm throwing it in the river. Even though it's been born, I'm just going to let it go. But she saw that crying baby and God moved in her heart. And she said, go get someone to nurse this baby. So we know being a mother isn't easy, but here's the thing. Mothers know. Mothers know. Moses' mother knew, if I can just trust God, if I can do something, if I can keep this baby alive. And I guess if you think about it, if push comes to shove, and she had been called in for Pharaoh's questioning, she could have said, hey, I put him in the Nile River. Right? He was in a basket, and he was safe. But I put him in there. But she worked hard to make certain that he was safe. And mothers know. Mothers know things. How many of you have ever thought you had gotten away with something like I said earlier and find out later on in life that your mom knew about it the whole time? Anybody? Is that not weird? That's weird how mamas just know. I guess that's where the saying comes from, mama knows, right? I guess that's also where the saying comes from, if mama ain't happy, there you go. But mamas know. She knew that she had to do something for this baby in order to keep him safe. She recognized that there was something about him. With all this turmoil going on and worry by the king, the Pharaoh, saying, hey, they're going to multiply until they get to a place that they can take over us. We've got to do something. But the midwives feared God, and they did not kill those children. And then they were blessed later. And God was good to the midwives. You see, God was present in this whole thing. How many of us would think about taking a baby, put him in a basket, and put him in the water? Put him in the reeds where it won't turn over. That would be a hard thing. But mothers know. And she had this feeling, the Bible says, that he was special. So she saw that he was special in verse 2, chapter 2. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But then there came a time that she could no longer keep him hidden. And she wanted what was best for him because she knew he was special. Mothers want what's best for us. How many times have we told our moms, you don't understand, you don't know. And then we get about 10 years older and we go, you're brilliant. You knew it all along. Why did I not absorb that? And then she might say something like this, because I was once your age too. (laughs) That's exactly what my mom said. I was once your age too. And I was like, no way. That's not possible. Really? Because at that point in time, 25 or 30 is pretty old, right? When you're seven. But mothers know And they want what's best for us. She wanted what's best for Moses. She knew God was going to do something amazing in his life and through him. And so she put him in that basket. They know what's best for us, even when we don't. Even when we think that they don't. 
And even if they don't act like it, even if they don't show it, even if they make poor decisions, even if there are addictions, even if there are other things deep in their hearts, they want the best for us. Have any of us ever heard the words, I want you to have it better than I did. I want you to have some things I never got to have. I want you to be able to do some things I never got to experience. Isn't that what we want for our children? She wanted God to be able to do something amazing in this child's life. And so she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket, waterproofed it with tar and pitch, and put it in those reeds. So they want what's best for us, but mothers try to protect us. They try to protect us. I don't know about you. I don't know your situation, but I know my mom always tried to protect me. Always. She took many a shot, be it verbal, be it physical, so that I wouldn't have to in the situation I grew up in. She always wanted to protect me. I never forget in a domestic situation, getting in the car one time, and she's like, get in the car, get in the car. And I opened up the door, and I get in, and then she gets in her side, and as soon as she says, lock the door, lock the door, doors locked. That was when you had to reach over and push the thing down. You know, it's like, oh, if it had been electric, I probably never would have gotten it, but I just reached over there and pushed it down and avoided a mess and a conflict, and we left. They try to protect us even with their own lives. Mothers will protect us to the end. I remember doing something that I didn't think was a big deal, and it turned out it was a big deal. We're having a dirt clod fight, and it turned out that the one I had had a rock in it, and I hit somebody in the head. I mean, I thought it was pretty good aim, but it wasn't a dirt clod. It didn't break. And so that dad came to my house and beat on the door like ready to tear the house apart. And I remember my mom going out there going, well, I'll deal with him. I will deal with him, but you're not coming to my house, and you're not going to do all these things. And that was comforting as I hid behind the clothes in the closet. <laughs> so, but mothers will protect us always. They always want to protect us and take up for us. Even if, and having been in the school business, I can promise you, everybody's child does no wrong. Amen? Well, my kid wouldn't. My kids never. And we learn those things as young parents that we say, well, ours is not going to act like that in a restaurant. <laughs> And all of a sudden, we feed them 74 goldfish before they eat so they can just keep, don't, stop making noise. Just eat. Eat. doesn't matter that your food's coming. Just eat. My child won't. My child wouldn't. My child didn't. Yes, they do, and yes, they would. And so we understand that mothers know they want what's best for us. They will protect us at all costs. And mothers always have a plan. Mothers always have a plan. It may be a plan they just formulate on the fly because they didn't have a chance, they didn't have a second, or as children, we put them in situations like the dirt clod fight, like the little incident on the bus, and a multitude of others I could tell you about all day. But they desire to protect us, and so they always have a plan. They always have a plan. I love that even in having faith in Almighty God, our Creator, God gives us a brain to make decisions and to make plans and to, to think and have common sense. Because the Bible says, She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds on the bank of the Nile River. Now get this. The baby's sister... Then stood at a distance, watching, watching to see what would happen. She's safe. She's a girl. She's safe. Just stand right over there. 
and hide out and watch that basket. Do not let anything happen to that basket. You're in charge. Maybe as a child growing up, it was a, a battle back and forth when your parents had to go to the store or come back, leaving a couple kids at home, which can be trouble, because somebody would always say, you're in charge. And my thing always was, why do you get to be in charge? Because I'm in charge. I can be in charge too because no parents are here. How about that? And the fight would ensue that would later groom me to be in a fight on the bus and get in trouble. So, um, but we have that moment in time where we say, I'm going to put this baby here, if you can imagine, and then your sister's going to be over there watching. I love you. I'm going to lay you down right here, and I'm going to trust that God is going to Use this moment. I put my faith and trust in him and in this situation. And my daughter is going to be over there and that's my plan. That's my plan. The baby sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river. Could have gone either way. Pharaoh's daughter could have said, hey, dad said, do this, so I'm going to tip the basket over. I'm, I'm going to, this is a little baby is a boy, so I'm going to dump him over and do what he said, because that was what he said should happen. But her attendants walked along the riverbank, then the princess saw the basket. She sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. The little baby was crying, and she felt sorry for him. God moved in her heart in a way that she could have compassion on that child. We need to have more of that. We need to have more compassion for innocent children. We need to have more compassion for the unborn. We need to have more compassion for each other. We need to be open to the Spirit to move so that we can love each other more and have compassion for each other. Because if we're outside and we're walking along the, the backyard and we hear something in the woods, we hear, meow, meow. What do we do? We go, oh, there's a kitten. There's a kitten. I must go save it. And then we go out and we save it. And we bottle, we call the vet. And we get a syringe. And we feed it and we feed it. And we take care of it and we tend to it. Or we see, oh, there's a, there's a group of uh, dogs over there. I wonder what's going on. Oh, there's some puppies. Mm. Let's go help save them. Let's bring them in. At least that's how it is at our house. I don't know. So, But we have to go and we have compassion for those. But what about for each other? What about for the human beings in our lives? What about for those little babies that are born and no one wants anything to do with them? What about the unborn? God is moving in our lives to have compassion as she did. She felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrew children. When the baby's sister approached her, the baby sister already says, hey, should I go like, get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby? And she's like, well, that's a good idea. She said, okay, mom, coast is clear. Coast is clear. Come on. How good is our God that he would make provision for all that to happen? Unbelievable. What could have happened and what actually happened? God made all that happen. And she said, yes, I do. So the girl went and she called her mom. The mom nurses the baby until it's older. And then when it's older, she realizes this is a little boy. He's older. But if I give him back to Pharaoh's daughter, he will live and God will use him because I know he is special. I know God is going to do something amazing. Mothers always have a plan. 
And mothers love us enough to do things that we may not understand for us. They do things that will protect us, that will help us, that will help us in our lives and decision making. You know, I think it's horrific whenever we see stories about other countries who are persecuted as believers. Women and children are persecuted and men are killed, martyred for Christ. But that women would say to children, run. I told them to just run as far and as long as they could. That I loved them. Knowing that that mom would never see that child again. And that child would never see that mom again. They love us enough to do those things. They love us enough to say, no, you're not going. I don't care if all your friends are going to be there. Be mad at me. No, you're not getting your phone back. You broke the rules. No, you're not getting your keys back. You came in too late. They love us enough to do that. And at the time, what? No discipline feels good at the time, right? But later in life, what happens? We say, no, you're not going. I don't care who all is going to be there. <laughs> no, you're not getting your phone back. No, you're not getting your keys back. But I don't understand. Well, I didn't either, but I got the same thing. I got the same thing. And you know what? You're a mini-me, and you're exactly like me, and this is what it must feel like to discipline myself. So, Because that's what I'm doing. I understand that. But they love us enough to do whatever it takes to help us be who God's called us to be. But lastly, later when he was older... She brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son. And the princess named him Moses. For she explained, I lifted him up out of the water. On Mother's Day, we do a lot of celebrating. We do a lot of thinking. Sometimes we shed a lot of tears. Sometimes there's a lot of sadness. Sometimes there's a lot of brokenness. All family, families aren't perfect. In fact, I don't know of any that are. And in saying that, I would share with you this morning that as much as we hold our moms in deep regard or as much as we need to forgive them and say, you know what, you made some th decisions, you said some things I, I don't agree with that were hurtful, but I forgive you because Christ forgave me. But here's the thing, moms, we love you, but we understand you aren't perfect either. You aren't perfect either, but Jesus is. And because Jesus walked on this earth and lived a perfect life and died for our sins and rose again on the third day, we can be forgiven and we can forgive and we can still love. It's a hard day for a lot of people. It's a great day for a lot of people. But understand this morning that because Jesus was perfect and because of what he did on the cross, there can be peace. There can be celebration. There can be praise. There can be visits, food. Or there can be fond memories and forgiveness. And a time of reflection. You know, some of those times we don't want to remember because they maybe weren't very good. But there are those times that even if our moms can't hear us now because they're no longer with us, either physically or mentally, we can share with our families. We can say, hey, one time when I was a kid, my mama answered the door in my brand new school clothes. Hey, mom. And 13 stitches later, she was not a happy woman. <laughs> and I remember having to stay with her at work that day at Broughton Hospital. That was an experience as well. So I learned a lot 
because of what I had done. That's not what she wanted, but I made that decision. And you see, as we grow up and as we go out, we make our own decisions. And these children that were dedicated this morning, one day are going to grow and make their own decisions. That's why it's so important, church, that we come here on Sunday. Every Sunday. That's why we volunteer. That's why we set up. That's why we tear down. That, man, that's why you go after service and help in the kids' areas because they've been down there pouring Jesus on their level into our children. That's why we volunteer. That's why we serve. That's why we give. Because one day these children are going to grow and make their own decisions. And you know, we make our own decisions. And we've had our times as children and young adults. And mom's not perfect, but nor are we. But praise the Lord, we serve a Savior who is. And God, our Father, wants reconciliation and healing and love today. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I want to challenge you. If you are here this morning and you just came to church with your mom or you came with someone else or you were just invited, maybe you're just checking us out for the first time. Maybe you're watching online for the first time. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's where it all starts. And you could say, hey, I remember I gave my heart and life to Christ on Mother's Day. I'd love to be able to share that with you. In just a moment after our prayer, during our time of invitation and dedication, you make your way right over here. I'd love to meet you. And just say, hey, here's how you can know Jesus on a personal level. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us. God, you've blessed us so much. We've been able to worship you freely and see these children or that one day we pray we'll come to know you because of what happened at Cross Point Church, what happened with mom and dad, what happened because of mom. Lord, you just touch each and every family. God, I pray that you just move as only you can during this time of invitation. Lord, you move your people to come and pray, to come and do whatever you are leading them to do, Lord without delay we just want to tell you we love you and we thank you for this word this morning thank you for the faith that was shared and your sovereignty and your deliverance in Jesus name and all God's people said amen would you stand please Listen, don't wait. Whatever it is, if God's moving you right now, make your way. Come right here. Come right here. I want to ask that you just make your way forward right now. I ask that you not leave. Or just stay right here so we can just see the Holy Spirit continue to move. Make your way. out church make your way don't wait don't wait that's it make your way That's it. Make your way.
trust you've been obedient this morning. Just want to let you know that no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your relationship with those around you, those in your family, the stuff you're going through, the struggle you're going through, it's not a surprise to God this morning. He's already making provision. He's going to take care of it. He's going to take care of you. Put your faith and trust in Him because He is great. And He is greater than anything on this earth. Anything. He has overcome the world. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of that.